Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to take a look at a 1940s forestry service radio transmitter and receiver pair. So the two separate units in one case, and that case is very, very heavy, lots of iron inside. So today I'm going to be your electronics or ham radio Elmer. I'll explain exactly how both the transmitter and the receiver work and what it's going to take to convert this into a ham radio. So this should be a lot of fun. Let's get started. Here is the transmitter receiver pair all in one case, a very, very heavy case. I'll show you the back side of the case here once I get these out, just because this is very heavy to move around on the bench. So because this is a transmitter and this is the receiver, the transmitter is mounted on the top for a reason, even though this is the heavier piece. So most of the iron will be in this piece right here. So the standard transmitter stuff, we have an antenna binding post right here, no coax, because that's just too fancy. We have a plate current meter right here, and you would tune this for a dip. So when you find the dip, that would be the point of maximum output or close to maximum output. A lot of the times the maximum output is just outside the dip, but um, I'll get into explaining that later when we get into tuning amplifiers. So it would make sense for a new operator to think tuning this for a maximum on the meter would mean maximum output. Well, it's actually the opposite way. You tune this for the lowest point on the meter here, and uh, that's when the output section in here is happy and it's working correctly. All right, so if you tune this for a maximum, uh, your output power is going to be lower and the output tube itself is gonna draw excessive current and you burn up your output tube. So uh, one of the radios in ham radio history, I think that was probably the hardest on output tubes, uh, just due to operators not understanding how the output section works, is the Yesu FT-101. I think output tubes feared that radio. I have pulled output tubes out of Yesu FT-101s that are completely melted. The glass is melted on the tubes. That's how bad and how hot those tubes got. Just because people were thinking, because they weren't using an output meter, that they, uh, that they, you know, would tune it and, uh, you know, look for a maximum on the meter and they would just melt those tubes. Uh, I know I have one somewhere. If I can find it, uh, I'll look for it through this video and uh, I'll see if I can find it and uh, I'll give you an example of one of those. It's, uh, one of them was really bad, I had to save it. Anyways, back to this thing. So we have a neon bulb here. Uh, its purpose might be just to indicate that the transmit section is on or they might actually have been using this as an output indicator. I really don't know. It's got a nice uh, uh, shiny spot on it. Looks like it's been in hard use. So transmit receive switch, microphone input most likely, I'm imagining. Uh, this control here is supposed to stay where you put it, but it's so well used that it won't stay in the dip. So it's, uh, yeah, if you were to use this in this condition, you would actually have to hold this in the spot where the dip is while you're uh, talking on the microphone or it would just, you know, as you can see it's moving on its own. <laughs> so that's pretty bad. So it's well used. On the bottom we have a receiver and it looks like a, just a single band. And we have a bead oscillator on the bottom here. I don't know if you can see that. And um, I don't know, let's see, can you see it? And you might be able to see that. Bead oscillator RF gain control here. So the bead oscillator would be for I guess you could say zero beating the transmitter into the receiver. So what would happen is you would tune this thing and you'd have a tone on this and you would tune this to the same frequency so that you can have them synchronized. Let's put it that way. They're not locked together. They're two completely separate units in one case. So we have a tone control on off and a volume control. Very simple. Uh, this here looks, we have K here. Maybe that stands for cam loops. And uh, let's see what else we have here. Well, there's Y. I don't know what that is. And uh, anyways, that's about it. So this looks like a portion that you can buy. This looks very national. I'm thinking that uh, it probably is national. And yeah, so this is, uh, I'll see if I can find this. I think this is part of a kit that you, or not a kit, but uh, pieces that you could buy to assemble this. Now this Oddly enough, this doesn't look like this was assembled by a company. It looks like maybe somebody was asked, maybe ham operator back in the 40s was asked to put something like this together. 
or maybe this was a very small run and a, a small company bought parts and pieces and put these things together because this looks like parts and pieces. Uh, again, this looks very national and you know, we have the chicken head knobs. This would be very easy to restore just because you could remove all the name plates, uh, you know, take out all the screws and everything on this would come apart and you'd have the, uh, you know, just a clean face plate and it would be the same with this. There's nothing uh, written on the face plate at all. You could take this apart and respray this and you would have a brand new looking transmitter, which I will do in the future. So I'll take this thing completely apart and uh, turn this thing into, uh, you know, a single band transmitter and receiver pair. So both of the uh, both of them will get restored in the case itself. Maybe remove the hinge, you know, pieces here and everything like that. So it'd be a really neat uh, neat little project. And I'll bring everyone along through that uh, process as well. So getting this thing apart doesn't look too incredibly hard. On the back there is no screws. So again, I would turn this around and show you the back side, but this thing is Let's see if I can give you an example here. That's just, it's just that, the whole bench is moving. Very, very heavy piece. So, and again, the transmitter is on the top. So, uh, yeah. Problem with these, uh, these screws, these slotted -in screws here on the top is that you can slip with your screwdriver and score things. Yes, very, very heavy. Okay. And you can see why it's so heavy. Look at all this iron. I guess big transformer back here. Another one here, another one here, another one here. So this is the transmitter right here. And it does have some wiring in the back. So you can see that here. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna just put this back on here for a moment. So what I'll do is I'll just pull the plug out of the back and get some of the wiring out of the way. I'll move this case out of the way and we'll take a look at the transmitter and then we'll look at the receiver. Ah. Here's a quick look at the case with the transmitter out. So you can see it slides into this little area here quite nicely. And on the back side, it's just a grill for venting purpose, I guess you could say. On the bottom is a little hole for the cords to run out. You might be saying, well, how do you know this thing is from the forestry service? Well, if I zoom on into this little tag here, there you have it. That's what it is. So British Columbia Forestry Service radio service tag. So the last time this was serviced looks to be in 1972. So I don't know what that says there. Something 27th of 72 possibly. So uh, and it's serviced by somebody's scribble right there. And uh, we'll take a look at how well this was serviced in just a moment. So we'll see how well the uh, the serviceman did his job way back when. Here's a look at the top side of the chassis. And what I can tell you from just looking at the top side is we have the power supply here and audio section. And this would be the RF section on the other side. Now, how I know this is very simple to recognize is you can see that there's a crystal here. So this thing is rock bound. It's, it's stuck on 3315. So way back when this would have been in the HF area and it would be 3.315 megahertz or 3315 kilohertz. So things have massively changed since way back when, like, you know, the police used to be just above the AM broadcast band, right? Uh, nowadays, everything's digital and, you know, we have cell phones and everything like that. Uh, I would imagine, I don't know this, but I would imagine that the uh, modern forestry service frequencies would probably be on VHF or something like that, or they use their cell phones or something. So, um, so this is uh, old stuff. So 3315 would have been the frequency that this transmitter was fixed on. And uh, who really knows? Maybe this even got into some other companies' hands and this is their frequency. I, we really don't know the history of this thing other than uh, what was on that tag, right? So this is a, a you know very nice looking little crystal here. You see that right there? So that just plugs into here. And this would be here to trim the crystal or make it happy and oscillate nice. Uh, we have the oscillator here, 6v6 crystal oscillator, nice 6v6M. This looks uh, relatively fresh, actually. So you see that there, 6v6. Let's plug this back in. 
And then we have a 6L6, which would be the RF output tube, and then the tank circuit right here. So crystal, crystal oscillator, output tube, and then basically from this into this right here through a transmit and receive switch. Uh, we have a bunch of adjustments. This is most likely to tune this to this, and this is most likely to make this crystal happy. So make sure it oscillates on the correct frequency, trim it up. We have another adjustment here, which I have no idea what this is for. Could be bias. Uh, who knows? So uh, we'll have to find that out when we look at the bottom portion of the chassis. Filter capacitor here, which is put in in a very, I don't know, I guess a sloppy manner. So I'll show you that here. See this? Somebody's replaced this and they've just tightened it off to the side. So there should be a washer under here and a washer on the top. So this could come loose. And uh, let's see if, well, look at that. So. So some radio serviceman is, uh, is uh, e, I guess, just trying to uh, get the thing back into service very quickly. So uh, don't vibrate or move the transmitter too much. So uh, anyways, that should have been handled in a different manner. We have the, the power transformer here, uh, most likely a filter reactor of some sort. Uh, this looks like an audio driving transformer for this section, so from audio to the output possibly high level modulation so possibly pa uh, plate modulated i'm not quite sure at this point uh, we'll have to find out and this looks like an audio interstage transformer of some sort so maybe from the microphone to the input of the 6c5 so the 6c5 would be the audio driver tube down here and this tube is going to drive the audio output tube which is most likely going to be in class a so another 6l6m so now most guitar amplifier owners know what a 6L6 is. A 6L6 is very common too, but there's quite a difference between the 6L6 and the 6L6 GC. So this is the old 6L6 version. So the 6L6M and the 6L6G are very similar, except one's in a metal package and one is in a glass package. The 6L6 GC, it has better plate dissipation ratings. So most of the modern amplifiers that you find will have the GC version. A lot of people say, hey, you know, I found a really cool old set of ST style, uh, uh, 6L6 is ST stands for shoulder type, which means that they have the uh, Coke bottle kind of look to them is how they're known. So it's not safe to plug those into a modern amplifier. It's okay to, to put a 6L6 GC in this because it has the better dissipation ratings, but you can't go the other way around. So if you have a modern guitar amplifier, do not plug old 6L6s in them. So 6L6G, 6L6GA, 6L6M, you don't want to plug those into a 6L6 GC socket. Okay, keep that in mind or you'll just destroy your tubes. Uh, we have a, uh, a rectifier here, which looks like somebody has made a solid state replacement. Why would they have done that? Well, you get a little bit more power output out of the uh, out of the uh, transmitter section, a little bit less heat, and um, solid state uh, rectifier or diodes have less drop. So vacuum tubes have quite a bit of drop across them, so uh, you'll lose a little bit of power in the uh, by running a vacuum tube. And in a case like this, if I restore this, I wouldn't care about that. Now this socket looks something like a like an eighty or a, maybe a five Z three or something like that. Uh, this is the old four pin style. So uh, an 80, a number 80 tube to power up this whole transmitter would have been a pretty bad choice back in the day in a design of something like this. Or maybe a 5Z3 would have been a, a better idea. But um, yeah, I really don't know what they've put in here. So come time to uh, restore this whole thing, I'll probably fit a proper vacuum tube in there just to keep this thing all vacuum tube. This is most likely maybe a gain control or bias setting. As I say, don't know yet because I haven't looked at the bottom side. Antenna binding post right here, which is very loose, which wouldn't be very good. So uh, that needs to all be tightened up. Uh, what else can I tell you? Meter and um, from the top side, that's pretty much it. So let's uh, let's take a look at what they've done on the bottom side. So very easy to recognize quickly is whenever you see the crystal, uh, you can pretty much see that this is in line here. So this would be the RF section and then we would have the audio section. So this would be audio and modulator section over here. And are they using the transformer as shielding between the two? Because these are all clamped to the chassis, so it's creating separation. They've also used metal type tubes, which the outer portion of the tube, if 
pin number one of the vacuum tube is grounded. That means that the shield is connected to the chassis, so you get lots of nice shielding on the upper side of the chassis. So uh, they did a good job in, in component placement on the top side here and by using metal tubes. I prefer glass just because it looks nicer, but uh, when it's in the case, you don't really see it anyways. So let's take a look at the bottom side. Well, now we know why the repairman's name was just a scribble on the tag. Look at this repairman work here. So we have a line cord here. That's uh, been taped up as well. And then the line cord runs into this black tape right here. One side of the line cord in this side, other side in this side, and this mess and then out. A filter capacitor taped onto the power transformer leads. And leads look okay. Doesn't look like the transformer is baked. Boy, those leads are tight onto the chassis right here. Looks like they're almost cutting the wires. So this was tacked into circuit. And we can see this one is tacked in the same way. So these were most likely changed at the same time by the same serviceman. Now you might be saying to yourself, what if this thing was repaired just uh, quickly because of an emergency or something like that? and was never looked at again. Well, we see on the repairman's tag, it says 1972, and these capacitors are uh, built well before 1972. So this was done well before that and was never fixed properly. So uh, the serviceman would need a talking to. So if I was that fella's boss and I saw this thing, oh boy, would he ever get reprimanded. That's just some bad work. It's not even tacked into the circuit properly. So anyways, right here we have the uh, some leads of the audio transformer which are just taped off. So whether the audio transformer has failed over time and they patched this up and basically changed its modulation scheme from a high level plate modulated circuit to maybe some form of reactor type modulation in a pinch, something like a Heising setup. Uh, that will have to be discovered at the time of power up. We'll see uh, what happens and maybe I'll even draw this up. So let's start here with the RF section first. So first of all, this adjustment here is not across the crystal. It's actually tuning the coil on the plate of the 6V6. So this crystal itself is you plug it in and where it is is where it is. You tune the plate circuit of the 6V6. And then this adjustment here between the 6V6 and the 6L6 is the drive level. So this is the amount of coupling between the oscillator and the output tube right here. And as you can see, the plates of this capacitor are almost fully meshed, which means that we've got maximum drive. So we're looking for maximum output out of this thing. You can see what they're doing already, right? This capacitor here is a neutralizing capacitor. Why is it called a neutralizing capacitor? Well, it stops the amplifier or the output section here in this case. Uh, from becoming its own oscillator. So we don't want this to turn into a VFO. We want this just to tune the circuit, not to tune frequencies. So this thing, without this capacitor, would have the ability to parasitic oscillate or uh, transmit on multiple frequencies at the same time. You don't want that to happen. You don't want this to turn into a VFO. We, all we want to do with this is dip the plate. So without this control right here, what would end up happening is this thing in some portion of the tuning by moving this thing around, we might find that it'll break into its own oscillation and start transmitting on two frequencies and then all of a sudden just stop when I get to this point. And uh, then all of a sudden it pops into oscillation as I'm moving this and then stops. So this neutralizes that effect. So that's a neutralizing capacitor right there from the output section running back to a previous stage is all that that does. So for the first tune up on this, so you would have this binding post on the front attached to the antenna. For the very first tune up, what you would have to do is tune the antenna with this, with this thing slid out of the case a little bit. And then of course we'd be looking for a dip right here. Once we find, you know, once we have the antenna tuned and everything, this could be slid back into the case and then only every now and then you'd have to check to make sure that the, you know, the final circuit here, the, the tank circuit is dipped. Okay. So we want to make sure that we've uh, dipped the plate of the output tube, let's put it that way, with this control every now and then. Now you can see that they've been looking for a dip a lot because it's looking for its own dip right now. So this is a very, very loose 
So this has been used a lot. So chances are there is some problem in the output section and uh, they were continually looking for that, uh, looking for that dip. Let's see what else. Um, yeah, so this runs off to the switch, which is like an old telecom or telephone type switch over here. And uh, basically this switches between receive and transmit. So it's switching multiple things in here. It's most likely switching some voltages. And then of course it's going to be switching right here. This is going to be switching from receive to transmit. So the receive, the signal from this binding post on the front in receive would come through here and go out into the receiver. And then when you click this into transmit mode, what would happen is it would cut this off. It usually would short this. And um, then we just have the transmitter running out of here. So that's what this switch would do. So this would be the receiver coax. Uh, this is another plug that comes out of the back of this, most likely either a speaker mute or this is going to cut the B plus in the receiver. The reason that they have this is when you click this into transmit mode, you need to mute the receiver. Or what will happen is when you're talking in the microphone, the mic will hear the speaker of the receiver and you get feedback. So you have to mute the receiver and that's what this is going to be for. There's multiple different ways of doing that. Some ways are better than others. Uh, cutting the B plus in receivers is not always a good idea because you get drift. So a lot of the times just muting the speaker is the best way of doing it. Unfortunately, uh, most of the common ways way back when was to actually cut the B plus. So you would get receiver drift by doing that. So we'll see what they've done when we look in the receiver here. So that's a quick overview of this. When it comes time to actually rebuild this and test this, what I'll do is I'll probably get a VFO and attach it to the crystal area right here. And I'll tune this into a ham radio or amateur radio band where it is legal to transmit on this thing. And uh, we'll tune this thing up in the AM phone section and uh, see if this thing makes any power and, and uh, maybe if it modulates. So we'll do that before we rebuild this whole thing. So it should be a lot of fun. It'll have to be brought up slow on a variac. Hopefully the filter capacitors are still working and everything like that. And uh, we'll see what they've done you know, with this uh, audio transformer. So the chain of events in the audio section, just before we go to the receiver, is uh, from the microphone and the jack in the front here, goes through this transformer into the 6C5. The 6C5 would then amplify that signal. The signal will be at the plate of the 6C5. The signal will go through the capacitor into the 6L6, which would be in class A. And then that would drive this transformer, which the transformer would then modulate the uh, RF output tube here. Now, again, they may have changed the scheme. It might be some form of um, reactor modulation or Heising modulation, or it might actually you know, still be plate modulated and they've just capped some leads off. We'll have to find that out. Nice looking little receiver, kind of cute. So we have the, uh, the removable little tags on here. The only thing I can see if I was to repaint this that would be an issue is this here, but it looks like somebody just added this and they've smeared something over top to stop it from being rubbed off with a finger. So I think that this could comfortably be removed. Uh, it looks like somebody's uh, scratched a J and a G in here, but that might just be done with a pencil or something like that. So that might be able to be removed. I think that's just done with a pencil. There is some writing on the dial and behind here. You know, say they put a little V here and then a K up here. So something can probably be done. I might be able to scan this and get rid of all of that and make a new little dial for in here. So one and a half amp fuse, very straightforward. A little pilot light on the front here, jewel light. So inside looks very well put together. I mean, this looks like this has been, you know, stamped out and they've made a bunch of these things just the way that this is done. So, uh, let's move the camera out just a touch so you can see all of this. So the chain of events, we have a rectifier here. It says 80 here. So I imagine there's probably the uh, tube, the rectifier tube and the transmitter is probably an 80 as well. Somebody's uh, taken a 3B28 socket and uh, shoved some diodes in there and made a solid state rectifier. So the 80 would be fine in here. You know, there'd be really no advantage to this other than heat. And, uh, but for the transmitter section, if the, it is using an 80, the diodes would have really benefited that for sure. A 6K6, so this will be the audio output tube. So this drives the audio output transformer, drives the speaker. A 6K7 off the front end of this capacitor, which is going to be the front end of this radio receiver most likely. So the signal will come in this little jack on the back 
most likely make it up into this area into one of these coils and then go into this as an RF amplifier tube and most likely through here into the converter and, or uh, mixer oscillator and uh, from this would most likely go over to the IF chain over here so basically into here into here and then this would be the IF amplifier 6SQ7 would be the detector and audio and um, hopefully you can see all this SQ7, and then it'll go from here into this tube and then out to here. This would be the BFO over here, most likely. 6SJ7, common tube for, for BFO use. So the chain of events is in this tube, from here into here, from here through here into here, from here through the IF chain gets detected, and then from there into the audio output tube into the speaker. And of course, just BFO use for zero beating, finding a, where you need to be. So, uh, pretty straightforward design. Nothing too special there. Let's look at the bottom side. Yikes. Look at all those Sangamo capacitors. <laughs> Whoa. I could start my own. My own sales, uh, you know, selling Sangamo capacitors from this thing. Look at all that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Lots of them. So, all of those have to go, and the filters have to go, and uh, another one up here. Other than that, it uh, looks like a pretty straightforward design. They leak a lot of the time, but, uh, you know, there's a good chance that this thing still works. So we'll find out here, and uh, we'll give it some power in just a moment. We'll try that out. How does that sound? So if this is the input here, it goes from here into here. Yeah, it's looking like the chain of events. So this would be the antenna coil, right? So it goes into here. Coax runs up here, and that would be this coil here. And then from there, it's most likely going to go. So this has got a grid cap on it. Yes, yes. So it's going to go. Yeah, so it runs into here and then into this. So this is the first RF amp right there. So yeah, it's the just as I thought, the chain of events is RF amplifier. And uh, this is most likely going to tune the plate uh, of this tube. And uh, this will probably be the oscillator coil and uh, maybe oscillator adjustment trimmer down in here. And then IF and a BFO. Very simple. So it should be a breeze to uh, rebuild this thing and uh, move it into the 80 meter phone band. So, so this should be around 3. Point, uh, what was that? The crystal 3.315, I think it was. So, uh, hey, let's uh, give this thing some power. I'll plug this thing into my isolation transformer and current limited variac supply. Let's uh, put that on current limit. Turn this on. Uh, that's good. Uh, let's see. RF gain. Cranked. Volume. We'll have the volume up. And uh, tone, whatever. Who cares? Beat frequency oscillator. Leave that off. All right. This would plug into the transmitter, by the way. So the transmitter would plug into this thing. And uh, let's turn this thing on. Light in there. Haha! <laughs> we have light. What's happening? Here, maybe we can get rid of some of this stuff. There we go. We have light. Be nice if the little dial here lit up, but it doesn't. So I'll let that sit for a little bit. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave this like this, and I want the uh, capacitors to reform for a little bit. So, I'll be back in about uh, oh, 15 minutes or so, and then we'll see uh, if anything's happening. So far, the uh, the bulbs are doing okay, so uh, pardon the bumping and the moving here, I'll show you. So, uh, I don't know if you can see that up on the top. Move out of the way. So the bulbs are dim, so they're doing okay up there, so no problems. Let's move the focus over here. Get this out of the way. So the bulbs are doing okay up there. So nice and dim, so that means that it's not drawing excessive current, so we're doing all right. Move this back down here again. And uh, again, I'll be back in about 15 minutes. I'll just let the caps slowly reform. About 15 minutes has gone past and the bulbs are still nice and dim. So that is a good sign. So if you recall, this thing had a mute on the bottom of it. So that would be the two larger pins here. One of the pins is grounded. So it's either grounding a cathode or a coil or grounding the speaker or whatever. 
Uh, when the time comes to go through this thing and recap, we'll figure out exactly what they've done here, but um, it's probably the cathode of a circuit or something like that. So let's see what they're doing. So let's ground this out. We've got the volume turned up nice and loud here. Turn it up just a little bit. Let's see what happens. All right, came to life. It's humming. Hear that? That's full volume now. So that's the antenna jack. Let's see what happens if I touch it. Listen to that. It's trying to receive with all these old parts. All right, so I have my 369 antenna over here, and I'll make sure that it's switched on. It is on. Okay. Let's uh, let's see what happens. I'll turn the volume way down because when I attach this, it's uh, probably going to get pretty loud. Well, that's good. I did turn that down. It's, uh, wow, it's pretty loud even at that. It's trying to receive. So, uh, let's pack this out here a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. Turn all the movement. Move this here. Okay, so, uh, move the dial. Well, it's trying to receive, there's just nothing on the band. Oh. What did I do? Oh. Well, tuning capacitor's got, uh, needs to be cleaned. A couple of dead spots here. Well, for a second, maybe we had a high voltage short or something like that. It's not uncommon, you know, you bring these things up and the capacitors go away, so. It's, it's alive, so while it is alive, let's see. So uh, the crystal frequency in the transmitter was 3.315. So what I'll do is I will turn on my signal generator. Give me here a moment here. Okay. Turn that on. All right, so 3.315. I'll just enter this here. 3.315 megahertz. And uh, I'm at... Uh, 50 microvolts, so that should be okay. There is some attenuation in this box. I still have this attached from another thing I was working on. So I'll attach this. I actually put this on the screw here. And uh, I'll attach this to the antenna input. So turn the volume up. Okay, so we have, uh, yes, and I'll give it some modulation here so we can find it. All right, so that's 600 cycles, 50% modulated at the crystal frequency. So we should be able to s find that on this dial. So is it because the uh, transmitter and the receiver should be, uh, ah, there it is. And it's right at the letter K. So there we have it. Not bad. It, so I'll remove the uh, antenna connection here. And I'll just show you that it's right at the letter K, right there. So I don't know if I can uh, move this around and show you this all at the same time. Well, the plastic boot on this is uh, gotten so incredibly hard, I can hardly pinch that open. So let's move this around here and see if I can demonstrate this. Letter K. So it's actually doing pretty good. You know, there's attenuation in this box as well. So it's, um, yeah, this is the tone control works. It does. RF gain works. So uh, that's at uh, 50 microvolts. And it, there again, there is attenuation in there. So the thing is receiving really well. And still, it's at reduced uh, line voltage because it's through the bulbs. So, uh... Let's uh let's bypass the dim bulbs. Here we go. Whoa, that's really coming to life now. So that's at full line voltage. So let's see what happens. Let's uh, take it down to 10 microvolts. Still there. And through the attenuation. That's actually a hot little receiver. Nothing's been done to it. So this should uh, very easily convert into the uh, 75, 80 meter phone band. 
So uh, just by moving the coils around here a little bit and a bit of tuning, I think this would make a really nice transmitter and receiver pair. So there we have it. Let's see if the uh, BFO is going to work. Let's see if that... Uh... Well, you can barely hear it in there. I don't know if you're going to hear that. Let's see if I move this around a little bit. It was working. It made a bit of noise and then it stopped. Yeah, so the BFO definitely needs some work. Yeah, not a big deal. That's nothing. The receiver is working the way it is. So, wow, not bad. So it looks like it may have been serviced through time a little bit. That cap in the corner here is missing and they've put some of these uh, smaller under chassis capacitors in here, but... Uh, other than that, it looks pretty much original, and uh, it's working like this, and it's very sensitive as well. So this should be a lot of fun. So in the future, we'll definitely put a transmitter-receiver pair together and uh, maybe make some contacts in the 80-meter or 75-meter phone area. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Hope you enjoyed this video regarding this 1940s forestry radio. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There will be many more videos like this coming in the near future. There will be lots of solid state electronic repairs, designs and rebuilds, and a lot of antique electronic repairs, designs and rebuilds. There's lots of very interesting things on this channel. It's about all things electronic. So let me be your electronics or ham radio Elmer and I'll pass my knowledge on to you. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, I have an ongoing electronics course on Patreon. You're definitely going to want to check that out. I also share my inventions and designs up there as well. I'll put the link just below the show more tab below the video's description and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the links, it'll take you right there. If you're enjoying this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and tap the bell symbol as well. If you tap the bell symbol, you'll be notified as soon as I post a brand new video here on YouTube as well. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.